There have been countless of supercars, but few of them have managed to become iconic, and the XJ220 is definitely one of them. Built on the golden age of supercars, the XJ220 managed to stand out from the crowd by bringing their own take, and went on a completely different direction from the rest. Originally designed for Group B racing, the XJ220 changed a lot from its original concept, but nevertheless, the car still turned out to be amazing. From the gorgeous body to its rumbling twin-turbo V6, the car was like nothing else. But the XJ220 also has a very interesting story, from conception to its amazing failure. So hello guys and welcome back to another video, and here is the story of Jaguar XJ220. Jaguar was founded in 1922 by William Lyons and William Walmsley in Blackpool, United Kingdom. Originally named Swallow Sidecar Limited, the company produced motorcycle sidecars, where they found some success. By 1926, the company had started building coach built bodies for different small cars of the time, such as the Austin 7, Walmsley Hornet, and Morris 8. And so, in 1927, the sidecar was dropped from the name, and it became Swallow Coach Building Company. In 1931, Lyons would release his first car, the SS1 Coupe and the SS1 Tourer, with SS standing for Standard Swallow. Standard being the company which was providing the chassis and the engines for the car. The SS1 was a huge success for Lyon, not only on sales, but also in racing, with the car winning a number of competitions that it entered. By 1935, Walmsley had left the company, and had sold his part to Lyons, which by this time had built a great team around him. Also, the company would change their name again, now to SS Jaguar, with the iconic Jaguar ornament appearing on the SS90 and the SS100 for the first time. During the World War II, the company, like many others, would start building airplanes, and stop the car production, which would only start after the war had ended. They would change their name for a final time, now dropping the SS and just being called Jaguar. Until now, Jaguar had used engines built by other manufacturers, but times after the war were different. Many manufacturers were destroyed and petrol was scarce. So, the team led by William Lyons built Jaguar's first engine, a 3.4 liter Stray 6, which originally was installed on the XK120, also designed by William Lyons. The 120 on the name was a hit to its top speed of 120 miles per hour, which made it the fastest car in the world at the time. The XK120 was succeeded by the XK140 and the XK150, which were faster and more powerful versions of the car. Look-wise, the cars were basically the same. These cars were very successful for Jaguar and helped their image a lot as a sports car maker. Meanwhile, Jaguar would start to enter to Le Mans, but with no success. This would change in 1951 when Jaguar would present the C-Type. The car was built solely to win Le Mans, and it featured a slick Barchetta body that had a modified version of the XK120 engine. The C-Type would go to win the 1951 and 1953 Le Mans. The C-Type was followed by the D-Type, which was a more refined version of the car. Jaguar would go to take second place in 1954 and first in 1955 after Mercedes withdraw from the race after the 1955 Le Mans disaster. Jaguar would continue to win Le Mans in 1956 and 1957. In 1961, Jaguar would present probably their most iconic car of all time, the E-Type.
Underneath, the E-type was basically a D-type, but was dressed with one of the most beautiful bodies ever put into production. The E-type would be in production from 1961 to 1974, where it would go into three different series, where the car would receive different changes both cosmetically and mechanically. In 1971 would come the third series, which would receive the most changes, the biggest being the engine. The car came with a 5.3 liter V12, which was built by basically joining two XK6 engines together. This engine originally was presented on the XJ13, which was a mid-engine prototype presented in 1966. Also in 66, Jaguar merged with BMC, merger which would bring many changes to the company. In 1975, Jaguar would become part of the giant known as British Leyland, but that's a story for another time. By this time, the E-Type had become quite dated. Lamborghini had the Countach, Maserati Tibora, Ferrari the 512BB and back home Aston Martin had the V8. So Jaguar needed a replacement. And this would come under the name of XJS. The car ditched the beautiful lines of the E-Type for a more boxier and conservative look which, quite frankly, was a big letdown. But despite its looks, the XJS became a quite a successful racing car, and this thanks to TWR. Tom Walkinshaw Racing was founded in 1976 by Tom Walkinshaw, where they would enter different cars in touring and car racing, such as Mazdas, Rovers, BMWs and even Range Rovers in the car. But their true success would come with the XJS. TWR would go to win races and championships all over Europe. So good was TWR that by 1985 they would take over Jaguar's works team. Meanwhile, Jaguar USA had built the XJR5 for the IMS GT championship. The car had found some success in the States but nothing special. Jaguar would bring the car in Europe and would enter it to Le Mans but would fail to find any success. So basically, TWR was given the task of winning Le Mans. First car under this partnership came in 1986, but the XJR6 wasn't very successful, with its best result being a win at Silverstone. The XJR6 would be followed by the XJR8 in 1987, again with no success. But everything would change in 1988 with the introduction of the XJR9. Jag would end up winning 1988 World Sports Car Championship including here the 24 hour of Le Mans. Also in 88, Jag would form Jaguar Sport in partnership with TWR. Jaguar Sport would act as an in-house tuner, basically offering power and cosmetic upgrades for the Jaguar lineup. Jag would continue to race the XJR9 through mid-1989, but the car has started to fail behind the rest of the group. The car would be replaced by the XJR10 in IMS and by the XJR11 for the World Sports Car Championship. But changes weren't enough to turn things around. But in 1990, Jaguar would go to win Le Mans with the XJR12. The bigger change would come in 1991, when the XJR14 was introduced. Jaguar would go to dominate the 1991 season. The car was a big departure from the previous XJR models and the car looked simply striking, especially with the purple silk cut livery. But the XJR14 also ditched the V12 engine, which the previous car had used for a twin-turbo 3.5-liter V6 engine, which came from the wild MG Metro 6R4. Jaguar had used this engine before on the XJR11, but the engine proved to be unreliable, but by this time TWR had sorted out most of the problems. But while Jaguar was dominating the racing scene, the same couldn't be said about the sales. By this time, the model lineup was quite old and dated, and had nothing to do with their racing cars. Jaguar was quite in a poor state financially, and in 1984 went into a major restructuring. First by leaving British Leyland and becoming a separate company. In the meantime, Jaguar had started working on a number of other projects in order to replace its current models, which had started to show their age. Most notably here were the XJ41 and 42 projects, with the 41 being the coupe version and the 42 the convertible one. The cars were heavily inspired by the E-Type, and here is where the idea for the XJ220 was born. 
Jaguar wanted to build a car that was basically a true racing car for the road, in a similar way that the E-Type was based on the D-Type. And in the 80s, Group B was the most popular form of motorsport, even surpassing F1 in certain points. This, combined with the regulations, made it a very popular racing series among manufacturers, with many teams entering or planning to enter, like Porsche and Ferrari were doing. Jaguar was no exception, so the work started to build a new Jaguar supercar. The project would be led by Jaguar's director of engineering, Jim Randall, who would go to build the first scale model. Um, one Christmas, 84 I think it was, I'd got nothing to do. So I, um, I, I sat down and thought, well, what is it we would race if we could really go back to what we were doing? Uh, back in the 50s, the sort of um, uh, D-types, C-types, things like that. And then started thinking about, well, what sort of car would you have to produce in that sort of category that would A, be a good road car, and B, be able to race. But at the end of the Christmas period, we had a, a quarter-scale model of the vehicle that we uh, would want. We worked out the structure, basically what the suspensions would be, the layout and so forth. And I got this thing on the um, dining room floor. Sadly, after a number of catastrophic accidents, FIA decided to cancel Group B. But this didn't stop Jaguar and Randall to continue the project. The two cardboard models, where one took inspiration from the Porsche 956 and the other from the Jaguar's XJ41 concept and XJ13 racing car, were sent to Jaguar Design Studio. Clearly, the second model was chosen since it looked more like a Jaguar than the other. Like I mentioned before, Jaguar was at a very good financial around this time, so the project basically got no funding at all, leaving Randall with no option but to put together a team of 12 volunteers to work evenings and weekends on their own time. It became, as I say, quite compulsive. And in the end, I, I got this thing in a quarter scale and I, I thought, well, might as well get somebody else involved in this. So I took it into Jaguar after the Christmas holidays and uh, gave it all Keith Helfit and said, put a skin around that, let's see what it looks like. That's really how it started. Later on, um, about 1987, early 87, I think it was, uh, we thought it would be nice to produce a, a concept car. And uh, I called for volunteers to work on this thing. We had no money, there was no budget. Um, all we had was the good will of the suppliers and a group of enthusiasts who's, who had to work in their own time, their own holidays and so forth. From the beginning, the car was supposed to be like the original Jaguars. Even the name of XJ220 was a hit to the target top speed of 220 miles per hour. The fact that the car was supposed to be built for Group B, it meant that the car had to be for wheel drive. Not an easy task for a mid-engine supercar, especially for Jaguar, which had no prior experience with four-wheel drive systems. So FF Developments was tasked with designing the transmission and the four-wheel drive system. Head of FFD was Tony Rolts, a British racing driver, which had been involved in a number of four-wheel drive projects. Most notably here, Ferguson four-wheel drive and Jason FF. He came with an innovative approach, which involved routing the power from the gearbox through the engine's V via a coil shaft, which was housed within a structure which was equipped with the supporting bearings, and this was connected to an inverted differential unit. Moreover, the gearbox also was quite special, with the front wheel drive derived from the centrally positioned differential seamlessly integrated into the rear transaxle. This configuration allocated 69% of the torque to the rear tires. Notably, the clutch system was a bespoke twin plate pull activated unit, purposely built by AP Racing for this project. For the engine, the plan was to go for a V12, which would derive from the racing project. There was no way we were going to be able to produce a new engine for the vehicle. What we had got was a four valve. V12 engine, which had in fact been developed for Group C racing, which was uh, an original Wally Hassan design, and which work had been done by Walkinshaw and Cosworth uh, to produce an engine which we, we raced 
in about 85, 86. It was very powerful, but not very economical. In fact, it wasn't very successful. But as a result of that exercise, I got five engines. So one of those had to go into the car. That's really what determined it was going to be um, a V12. Differently from the road going engines founded on the XJ and the XJSS, which had a single overhead camshaft and two valves per cylinder, the XJ220 would have a double overhead camshaft layout with four valves per cylinder. The displacement, which on Jags racing cars was at 7 liters, was set at 6.2 liters for the XJ220. But definitely the best part of the XJ220 was the design. The design was simply put striking, especially compared to what Jaguar was doing at the time. Like I mentioned before, the design took a lot of inspiration from the XJ41, which Jaguar had been developing since the early 80s. And like the XJ41, the XJ220 paid homage to Jaguars of old. Beside this, Jaguar decided to put scissor doors to the car, making the car even more striking. But one very notable thing was the size of the car. The car was huge, compared to all the supercars of the time. The wheelbase was set at 284cm, while the length at 514cm. The production car was a bit smaller than the concept, but again huge compared to the rest. The interior on the other side was the typical supercar interior of the time, with a driver focus cockpit and stuffed with leather. The prototype was finished just in time to be unveiled at the 1988 British Motor Show. One of the most interesting things is that the car not only made its debut on front of the public for the first time, but also to the most of Jaguar employees who hadn't seen the car before or had no idea that the car was even being developed. The car was a huge success, the design combined with amazing specs made the car the main piece of the show. Originally, the XJ220 wasn't meant for production, but just as a showpiece of what Jaguar of Futures could look like. But the response was so amazing that, that people started handing over blank checks to Jag just to allocate a spot. So Jaguar and TWR concluded that the project was actually feasible and Jaguar could actually make a profit from this, on top of publicity that the XJ220 would offer. Jaguar's initial plan was to build uh, 220 to 350 cars at a price of 290,000 pounds, which would be around 670,000 pounds in today's money. Jaguar started taking orders in January in 1990 with plan to start deliveries in mid-1992. But even before presenting the prototype, Jaguar had it doubts if the car could go into production with the same specs that they had presented. The main reason was the size and the weight of the car. The XJ220 was ginormous compared to all the other supercars of the time, like the F40 and the 959, and even to cars that actually were huge such as the Vector 8 and the Chizeta V16. The main reason for this was the V12 engine and the 4-wheel drive system, plus the quite luxurious interior and this extra weight would affect the driving experience a lot. So Jaguar sports team, which was taxed with the development of the XJ220, started to work on finding ways to make the car a bit shorter and lighter. First, Jaguar decided to change the engine. The new engine was a 3.5 liter V6, which was a twin turbocharged engine. This engine was based on the same engine that the Group P Monster, the MG Metro 6R4 used which essentially was a shortened version of the legendary Rover V8. Like I mentioned before, TWR would originally use this engine on the XJR10 and the XJR11, where they would increase the displacement from 3 to 3.5 liters. On the racing version, the engine produced around 800 horsepower, but of course the engine was detuned for the XJ220. Another reason that Jack decided to go for a V6 and not for the originally planned V12 or uh, even a V8, beside of course the fact that the engine had proven itself on the racing circuit, were the European emission regulations that had started to come in power in the early 90s. The engine would produce 542 horsepower and 473 pound-foot of torque, which were up there with the best supercars of the time. 
while the engine reduced the length of the car, the all-wheel drive system would reduce the weight of the car. Back in the 80s, the all-wheel drive systems were extremely heavy, and Porsche with the 959 was the only one that had managed to make it work on a supercar, and of course the EB110 later. Jack found that the system didn't break much in terms of performance and driving experience, especially compared with the extra weight and complexity that the all-wheel drive system brought along, so they decided to go for a rear-wheel drive layout. On the other hand, of course, you have to accept that in order to produce the car within the time constraints, within the cost constraints that were there, it is much more logical to use something that's already developed. What we had here, of course, is the Group C engine, um, which only had to be uh, detuned somewhat in order to make it a very effective and very tractable engine. Once you decide to do that, the centre of gravity went back and therefore there was no need for front-wheel drive. You can get pretty well all the traction you want out of rear-wheel drive, so that simplified the front end. Um, and that's, again, it, it was the d decision really to go for the V6 engine uh, that, that changed the whole thing. The last major thing that would be removed from the concept were the scissor doors, which were replaced by normal doors, this for the fact that they were safer and simpler. After all these changes, the final car would become 20cm shorter and 400 kilos lighter. But again, despite this, the car was still massive compared to the rest of Supercross all the time. All these changes, especially the dimension, meant that the XJ220 designer Jim Randall and Keith Hilfett had to work a lot in order to keep the car to look as closely as possible to the concept. After the design was finalized, a full-scale clay model was made, which was presented in front of a top Jaguar executive and Tom Walkinshaw, which gave a green light. With the approved design, Jack started working on the chassis and the final technical development. But one very interesting thing is that Jaguar was developing another supercar around the same time, again in partnership with TWR, under the Jaguar Sport Division. Differently from the XJ220, which was a road car inspired from racing cars, the XJR15, as the car was named, was basically a racing car for the road. Like many others of the time, the car was basically built for homologation purpose. The car was based on the XJR9, and like the original XJ220 prototype, the XJR15 actually used a V12. The design was completely different from the XJ220, and also different from the XJR9. In my opinion, the car actually looked better, maybe because the proportions were better, but the story of XJR15 is a story for another time. By June 1st, 1990, the first running prototype, codename X001, was ready, and Jaguar had finally started testing the XJ220 on the track. Four more fully functional hand-built prototypes were built, numbered from X002 to X005, which were used for all kind of tests, speed and reliability, and how well the car functioned in general. Also, two more full-scale models were built which were used for crash testing. A number of racing drivers, mostly from Jack's racing team, became the testing drivers of the XJ220. Most notably here, Martin Brandl, Tom Walkinshaw and Andy Wallace, which later would become Bugatti's testing driver. But Jaguar would go to build 5 more prototypes, and differently from the first 5 which were completely hand-built, these were built with actual production part, which came out of the production line. Talking of which, like many other supercars of the time, Jaguar decided to use some parts which came out from other car makers. This included the rear lights, which came out of a Rover 200, and the side mirrors, which came from the Citroën CX. But again, this was nothing crazy for the time. And considering that by this time Jaguar was bought by Ford, the fact that the only thing that they shared with Ford was the key is quite impressive, to be honest. Most of the tests were done at the Millbrook Proving Ground and at the Nardo Ring in Italy, where the car managed to hit top speeds of 343 km/h or 213 mph, which was pretty close to the 220 mph mark. But Jaguar wasn't pleased with this, since they wanted to hit 220 mph no matter what. 
they would try again in 1994. This time, Jaguar removed the catalytic converters and would increase the rev limiter to 7900 rpm, something that most supercars did at the time where they did the fastest car runs. A car with a chassis number X009 would hit a top speed of 217.1 miles per hour, putting it on the Guinness World Records as the fastest production car in the world. The XJ220 would keep this record from 1994 to 1998, when it was beat by the McLaren F1 with a top speed of 240.1 miles per hour. Jaguar also sent one of the prototypes, the X005, to Nürburgring, where the car hit a lap time of 7 minutes and 47 seconds, which was a record for any production cars of the time. In October 1991, the first production XJ220 chassis number X008 made its first debut to the public at the 1991 Tokyo Motor Show. This later, the car would make its official debut back home at the XJ220's factory in Oxfordshire, where Princess Diana officially unveiled the car. Until now, everything had gone perfectly for the XJ220, the tests were going well and the production days were coming closer and closer. But here is where the first problems would start for Jaguar. By 1992, a lot of things had changed. The recession of the early 90s saw interest rates go up to 15%, so the price of the XJ220 went up to £460,000 from the original £290,000, which is almost £1 million in today's money. And UK wasn't only one that had gone into a recession, most of the world was in financial crisis, most notably here, Japan, which had been one of the biggest markets for European supercars. So Jag saw many XJ220 customers refusing to take delivery of their cars. And Jaguar learned that the number of the XJ220 buyers were looking just to flip the car right after they purchased. Changes like the engine and the four-wheel drive system might have played some role to this, but I think that people just used this as an excuse to get out of their contract. The early 90s saw the introduction of many supercars like the Bugatti B110, the Chiseta V16, Vector WX3 and also the McLaren F1 which similarly to XJ220 had a very short life and didn't manage to hit their sales targets. Lamborghini and Ferrari also were facing hard times. Not to mention here the countless supercars that never made it after the prototype phase or only managed to produce a couple of cars. Most of the reviews of the time were pretty good reviews, both for the styling and performance and also for the driving experience, so the car wasn't far from the original concept when it came to the numbers. In fact, Jaguar had to prove this in court, where they sued the people that refused to take deliveries. Jaguar actually won, but this didn't change much. Such a disaster, the XJ220 project turned out that dealers were stuck with XJ220s for years. The last car was actually sold in 1997 for £127,000. The production ended in 1994, with only 285 cars, including here the 10 prototypes built out of the 350 cars that Jaguar had originally planned. Most of the cars were sold in Europe, with the rest going to Middle East, Japan and Brunei. The XJ220 wasn't originally sold in America, but a number of cars went made it into the States by show and display examples. The XJ220 was available on a number of colors. Spa Silver, which was the most popular one, Loma Blue, Silverstone Green, Monza Red, Daytona Black, Special Gloss Black, Diamond White and Jaguar Racing Green with the latter ones being the rarest. In the meantime, Jaguar would enter the XJ220 in a number of races, most notably here the 1993 Le Mans where they also presented the XJ220S, which was the racing version of the car. The XJ220S had a number of exterior changes, like fixed headlights instead of the pop-ups and a massive rear wing. Also some body panels were replaced with carbon fiber ones. The power increased from 500 horsepower to 690 horsepower. Jaguar would enter three cars at the 1993 Le Mans on the GT class. Two of the cars would retire, both with engine failures. 
Balthakar, driven by John Nielsen, David Brabham and David Coulthard would go to win, finishing first on the class. But the car would be disqualified because Jaguar ran without catalytic converters. Jaguar would appeal the ruling and actually win, but nevertheless they were disqualified, as the AOC confirmed that the appeal had not been lodged in time. The car would enter in a number of races, both in America and Europe, both by Jaguar and private teams, but with no success. Also, Jaguar will go to build six homologation versions of the XJ220S. But talking about racing, the XJ220 would go to be part of one of the weirdest and craziest racing series in history. Fast Masters was launched in 1993 and would be a single model racing series that would air on ESPN. The idea of a single mark or model wasn't something very unique, especially for the time, but faster masters would be like nothing else. First, the championship would take course over 6 weeks, with all the races being held at the oval part of the Indianapolis Raceway. Secondly, all the drivers were retired Formula 1, NASCAR, Indy and other series. All of them were over 50, making the series a senior cup challenge and all this would go to make a fantastic disaster. 10 cars were originally entered and from day one, the Fastmaster would become famous for its crazy crashes. The series was a complete disaster, with all the sides losing millions on it, mostly due to the crashes. YouTube channel The Motorsport Story has made a great video about the story of Fastmasters, which covers the complete story of it. The last thing that I want to mention is the Pininfarina XJ220, which was built for the Royal Brunei family. The car featured a completely different style from the regular XJ220, with a restyled front and rear end. Personally, I have never been a big fan of the front end of this car, but I always loved the rear of it. It has always reminded me of the Ferrari Mythos, which Pininfarina had designed a number of years prior. Besides the stylistic changes, the car also featured a completely different interior, a much better looking one in my opinion. But one of the most interesting changes was the gearbox, which was replaced with F1 style gearbox like most of the special Brunei cars of the time. For some reasons, a Pinafarina front end appeared for sale in 2023 on eBay and sold for $6,000. So this was the story of Jaguar XJ220 one of the most amazing supercars of all time, which sadly did not receive the love that it deserved. Would have been very interesting to have seen the XJ220 or on Group B, or to have seen what would have happened with Jaguar Sports if the XJ220 would have been a success. But the car was a true product of its time, when building supercar was seen as a sign of prestige and, th and that's why we saw so many car makers build one. So guys, thank you for watching and see you next time.